Man, got around. OG7 back here. And today, like each and every day, that I'm blessed to breathe another breath on this plane we call planet Earth. I'm going to share with you guys some stories of victory and glory coming from my own personal life, my personal experiences, things I've witnessed and seen and actually experienced in life to share with you the victory of understanding. Once you understand the use of weapons, you can defeat any foe in the glory of understanding. Sometimes the best weapons you have are the ones you invent yourself. Without further ado, I want to get into the topic of today's video, which is in maximum security prison, the weapon I use to defeat the Bloods, Crips, BG, uh, BGF, and Mexican gangs as a loner. And it's a big secret I'm going to share with you guys. As always, guys, I want to give a disclaimer. This story I'm going to tell you is true. It's based on my experiences. I remember in the past, man, I would share my stories as a lone wolf. And a lot of guys, I don't know if they did uh, time in level one or level two or minimum security or patty cake camp or one time in band camp, whatever the fuck their situation is, cooking marshmallows on the campfire. They were talking about, oh, man, that's not, nobody can walk prison yard alone. Nobody can ride alone as a lone wolf. You got to join a gang, a gang, a clique, a set, a barrio hood. But that's not true, man. I'm from back east. I joined the military, got stationed in California, got in trouble, and I got sentenced to 26 years in maximum security prison. And this is how it went down for me based on the fact that I'm mixed with four different ethnicities. I didn't want to disrespect Either my parents or my grandparents, my, my maternal grandparents, my paternal grandparents on either side, uh, the Indian, the Spanish, the African, or the European by joining some clique or some set or some uh, faction that represented one waste race. Because in prison, maximum security prison especially is segregated. They got the blacks, they got the whites, they got the Mexican or Latino or Hispanic. And they got the other, which is lumped in all the Polynesians, Hawaiians, the Asians, mixed race people. I'm not going to lie to you guys, though. I was fearful. I was more afraid of being violated than I was of dying. So I just had a lot of anger because I felt my life was over. But I want to share with you guys, man, the weapon that I used to defeat the gangs, dude. Because I had a lot of uh, run-ins with gang members. Is this by no means a disrespect or a diss to any gang? Throughout this story, I'm going to tell you stories where, yeah, I had some run-ins with gangs, but then I also made some affiliations and friends with gangs. And it was based on a misunderstanding, which I used those misunderstandings uh, to my benefit. So I'm going to I'm gonna start from the very beginning. And this is, I think, the first time that I was uh, arrested. I shot some guy in an Oak Park. And then I got arrested. I was in the military going up to see my wife. Uh, when my wife, we were estranged, we were uh, separated, and she moved up to Rancho Cordova. So I'm driving up from Monterey, California, and you know, you run out of gas, dude. And I didn't know, I didn't know, I never been to Sacramento before. I didn't know about Oak Park and Del Paso Heights, and I pulled in to get some gas because I was on empty. And the guy tried; these two guys tried to rob me. I shot him, and I had my I had my weapon that I purchased on base of Fort Ord. It was my own personal weapon. And so then I left the scene of the crime because I wanted to see my family. And so there was a camera at the, the gas station, of course. Got my license plate. They called the police. High-speed high chase. I got to the apartment complex where my ex-wife lived. SWAT team, everybody, you know, pulled me out. Luckily for me, there was a lot. It was during the day. So a lot of witnesses. They couldn't just shoot me down because I didn't resist. So I get to the Sacramento County Jail, man. And it was just like, dude. There was this big, swole, crip dude, and you're in a holding cell. And so this dude would say, he, they, they know you're not from there, dude, because the people that commit crimes in the local areas, they know each other. It's like recidivism. There's generational fucking legacy of criminals and gang affiliation. They know I wasn't from there. So anyway, uh, I think I actually have my military uniform on too, man, if I can remember properly. I want to tell you guys. As best as I can recollect, I think I did. I had just left, uh, got back from deployment and wanted to go see my wife. And I didn't even change up because I was in a hurry to hit that traffic in California. You know what I'm talking about. 
So anyway, dude, I get in there, he's talking about, oh, you're going to pay rent and this and that, and I'm king, crip, low, whoop de whoop And I'm just frustrated, upset, because I want to see my wife, I want to see my kids. Got back from deployment, man, and I wasn't having it, dude. So while he was talking, running his mouth, dude, I just remember I did a straight front thrust kick. And just so you guys know, you guys who are taking my Patreon and you have signed up for one-on-one -on -one coaching calls and, and Zoom fights, you know, my, my favorite tool when I actually get into combat with a guy, I like to use my legs because they're more, they're longer and more stronger, more powerful than my arms can ever be. So I did a, fresh, a straight front thrust kick. Bow! That's my go-to move. And when his head came forward, I just took my fist and I turned my body into it and I knocked his jaw across his face as he was, his mouth was open like that. And then as he went sideways, I just went with the force and I did physiology. I did a judo toss, man, and tossed his face onto the um, the metal bench where I was, no, it was actually a cement bench. Wait, metal bench. Yeah, it was a metal bench where I was sitting, tossed his face on there, bow! So what happens when you're in a holding tank, it's a lot of different cats in there. There was some uh, bloods in there, and they assumed that I must be a blood from out of town or something, so they they put the Namakur blood on me. This is just a, this is just to catch you up, guys, to what happened. So then, the next time I shot a cat, man, I was down in uh, Seaside, California, and I ended up going to the Salinas County Jail. And there's a lot of bloods down there. So there was a blood dude talking about, oh, what set you represent? Where are you from? I was like, man, I ain't with all that, man. So I broke this dude off. So just so you know, there's more Crips in Seaside. Well, actually, in California, there's more Crips than bloods, but it just depends on the area. So the, the cats from, uh, the cats from uh, Central California thought I was affiliated with the Crips. And the cats from Northern California, because California is se separated, the cats from Northern California thought I was just, uh, affiliated with the Bloods. So that's the background story. So then in the Salinas County Jail, there was a race ride between the Mexicans and the Blacks, right? So that went down, man. So then when I get to San Quentin and hit the yard there, it's mostly Bloods. They don't let the Crips and Bloods out on the same yard. Why? Because there's racial tension. And so the Crips have got a separate yard than the Bloods, so I'm on a yard with the Bloods, and I told them about the um, the race riding in Salinas County Jail because then the Northern Mexicans were trying to act cool with the Blacks. And I don't, man, I'm mixed Hispanic, Black, whatever you want to call it. There's this cat telling me about my genealogy. I know what my parents are. So it just doesn't, it doesn't matter to me, and I don't take sides, but here it is. When we in the Salinas County Jail, the Mexicans had a ride against the Blacks, man. They put in work. But now we hit the yard where it's mostly blacks and the Mexicans is trying to act like they're cool. So I told them, nah, man, them, them Norteños, man, they ain't not cool like you think they are. So a riot ensued from there. So then when I get to, I get to New Folsom level four, maximum security. Um, no, there was a riot and there was a riot in, uh, I'm going to get to the story, guys. There was a riot in San Quentin. It was, uh, it was a blacks against the whites because the Mexicans were on lockdown. And it's not because I told the brothers that the Mexicans um, had a race ride in Salinas, California. It just it was the way it played out. It was just some racial tension. So the Mexicans didn't have yard the same time as the blacks did and the others. And it's not because I said we had a race ride with them in the county jail. It's just the way it played out. So anyway, there was a race ride between the, the blacks and the whites. So basically what happened, we in the chow hall. And I'll, I'll go into another video, but I want to I want to tell you guys about this secret weapon that I use. So anyway, we're in the chow hall, man, and then uh, I guess the, the the word was out that you know if you're sitting at a table with a black when they, when they give the when they give the call when they set us down to eat chow, you got to put in work. So the white dudes is trying to stab anything brown because all the Mexicans was locked down. I'm really good at what I do. I got a particular set of skills. I was just handling my business, man. So then the BGFs, after we after we on lockdown, the BGFs say to me, which stand for the Black Gorilla family, hey, hey, young blood, I see how you handle yourself, man. Who you riding with? I was like, nah, I don't, I don't ride with nobody, man. I'm just here doing my time. I had 26 years. They say, well, you can't, you can't ride in prison alone. You got to ride with us. And I was like, nah, I ain't, I ain't ride with nobody. So basically, I found out early on that everybody in prison clicks up. You got to be with the Black.
blacks, the Mexicans, the whites, the other, the BGFs, which stands for the Black Gorilla Family. The Mexicans are split up into Norteños, Serenos, Mexican Mafia, Nuestra Familia, El Salvadorian, Cartels. The blacks are split up between the Crips and the Bloods. Even the Crips are split up between Hoover, Crips, and all these. It's due to so many different factions and so many different wars. It's crazy, but then it's it's even split up to where you just got the blacks who, they, they're not gang members, so to speak, but they're just like sets, like the northern blacks, you know what I mean? They ride together like that, and uh, blacks from different, like the, the guys from the Bay Area, they ride together like that. And then even the whites are split up. You got the Woods, the Pecker Woods, you got the, the Aryan Brothers, you got the KKK, you got the Hells Angels, you got all kinds, of, it's just... Look here, guys, I'm trying to be positive, but it's just a bunch of weak dudes that band together because there's uh, strength in numbers. So here comes the weapon that I use because in, in prison, nobody fights fair. Everybody gets a shank, which they call a candy bar. That's the secret code. You want to get a candy bar. Everybody's packing shanks. That's why the guards, every time you leave your cell or come in and out from the yard, they do random pat downs, check your cell. So I'm not trying to, you know, give away any penitentiary secrets, but I always kept my shanks on the yard, man, in, in very um, unobvious places that only I knew about, or I keep my shanks in books, different things like that. So I carry shanks as well. And then they have stuff like, uh, they call them dookie bombs, where dudes just like poop in a plastic bag and they vomit in it. They put hot sauce in it and chili peppers. And they carry it in their pants, so then they could just explode into your face, right? It's really, it's really messed up like that. And then, uh, what else did I see in there? Bone crushers, of course, and all kinds of like tomahawks and stuff like that, which for me are hard to conceal. So let's just say we all carry weapons in there. So this is the whole thing. If everybody's got a weapon, what's the secret weapon I use? You know, of course, you know about my martial arts skills. But this is what I tell people, and I want to be honest with you guys, man. If you're in a situation where you're in a knife fight with a guy, even if you have a knife or you're a skilled knife fighter, the reality is this, guys, you will get cut. That's why the professional knife training I've had in the military and Israeli people and um, Arnis and Eskrima and Serata and, and combat knife training, this kind of thing, they all tell you ahead of time you're going to get cut, but you just determine where and how. Instead of getting cut in your vital organs here, you know what I mean, where you can bleed out, they, I'm going to tell you the secret without you joining my Patreon. They, they suggest you get cut on the outer portion of your arm because even if you get cut there, it's not um, it's not a mortally fatal wound, right? So anyway, I want to get straight to the, the point of this video. The secret, the secret, the weapon that I used wasn't a secret weapon. It wasn't a shank. It wasn't my martial arts skills. What it was was my semen retention. And the reason I had to make this video, I had a couple value subscribers talking to me about semen retention. Guys are debating in the comments section and they're debating on the internet. Oh, semen retention don't work. Oh, it causes problems with your prostate. Oh, it doesn't really work. Oh, it works great and it puts you on a higher level. I'm here to tell you guys the transparent truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth because as I look to transform and evolve to the next level, I don't know. I'm in the last quarter of my life, so I'm trying to prepare for what's on the other side because I don't know what's on the other side. I don't think anybody truly knows, but I'm trying to rectify all the bad I did by giving you good, you guys good, honest, and correct information as I've experienced it. So what I decided early on, man, I just knew from when I used to box and I used to compete in martial arts and powerlifting, the professional coaches that I hired would tell me, hey, you know, um, 90 days before the event, um, don't have sex with your wife. And I remember my wife didn't like that, but it was just how it is because whatever, whatever I do, guys, I hire a coach, somebody that's been there like a champion, different level type of champion that knows what they're doing. So I don't make a lot of beginner mistakes because it's better to learn correctly the first time than to learn something incorrectly and have to unlearn it. So I remember when I was on the street competing, they were saying, yeah, don't, don't have sex 90 days before event. And I remember, dude, I would be so powerful and amped up. And for those of you guys that have never experienced that, right? Those of you guys that have never experienced that, I suggest you, uh, I suggest you experience it, man. Because it's a very powerful, it's very life-changing, you know what I'm saying? 
and uh, it can help you, man, to really uh, to really get to know yourself, man. So anyway, guys, I wanted to tell you that because what happened is uh, I made a determination because when I was in San Quentin level four, I was on the fifth tier with all the murderers and lifers and serial killers and cannibals, dude. I would hear guys beating their meat at night and then having, you know, uh, sodomite sex and stuff like that. And I made a determination that I was not going to um, defile myself or to release my seed. None of that stuff, dude. I made a determination because I was by myself. My back was against the wall. I didn't know anybody. I knew some dudes on the street. But see, here's the problem I want to share with you guys. Some guys didn't know I had shot some of their homies because they lived on the other side of the town or maybe it was their family members. It was just a matter of time before the homies and the family members got together because there was one faction on the street that hated me because I had smoked some people. There was another faction on the street that thought I was just a good, a good dude, like a cool dude, right? And I knew it was just a matter of time for the two factions got together. I'm the odd man out. I'm a dude. I'm an out-of-towner. I'm a foreigner, so to speak. And it's just a matter of time for the family members and the cliques get together. No, nah, man, he killed Cousin whoop de whoop or he smoked Uncle Joe, or he put, he put my brother Bob in a wheelchair. You know what I'm saying? I'll get into those stories in another time. So I made a pact with Almighty God because uh, at the time, man, I, I was a Christian. I believed in Almighty God. Now I want to tell, tell you guys, man, that uh, I'm agnostic. And what that means to me, I don't know if it's the right word. I do believe in the Almighty God. I believe in the Almighty God, powerful God. I just don't know what to call this entity because there's so many different religions. When I was in maximum security prison, my 10 years, I studied theology. I got a degree in theology. I studied all the different religions from Islam to Catholicism to Judaism. I even studied Luciferianism, um, Satanism. I studied Jehovah's Witnesses. I studied the Mormons. And just so you know, there's different factions of Christianity. I've even studied uh, Buddhism and Confucianism, right? So all I'm saying is like, you know, I believe that there's an almighty God. So I prayed to that almighty powerful spirit. And I said to the spirit, I promise to you. And I did the oath of Samson when Samson said to, to the God Yahweh, I will not cut my hair as a Nazarene if you will give me the power to smite down my enemies. And dude, I was so deep into religion because, you know, it's interesting when you go to maximum security prison, dude, you're in hell, man. And I'm here to tell you, it's, it's not an exaggeration. I'm talking about, you know, maximum security prison. I'm not talking about these prison channels where you guys are telling you all these fictional fairy tales where there's high morality and the homies look out for each other and there's no butt sex and there's no, there's no homosexual sex jumping off and all that dude i don't know what fairy tale land they live in nor do i care all i care about is this dude perception is reality my reality was perceived in the deep dark dungeons of the level four maximum security prison dude with lifers and murderers and savages right lions and tigers and bears oh my and that formed my personality and that's why i had to go through counseling dude because I don't look to want to be a savage barbarian beast on the street because then if you act in barbaric animal ways, you get locked up with animals. Hey man, life is too beautiful, baby. I don't want to be locked up no more. So I share with you young guys who are misguided, misinformed, and ignorant, dude. And ignorance is not a bad word. It just means that you are not informed properly because your homies lie. Why do homies lie? They have a, a hidden agenda. They want to keep you in this gang thug life mentality to this hood mentality because you think there's there's a, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow but it's all an illusion dude it's all a hologram if you ever follow any rainbow there's never a pot of gold at the end they always the rainbow ends and it's an illusion there's nothing there there's nothing there so i'm sharing this with you guys because dude in maximum security prison this was the problem and i just want to be forthright with you man you know since the Bloods thought I was a Blood, they wanted me to join the Bloods. So first it was the Up North Bloods. I was like, nah, man, I ain't ride with nobody. No, nah, big homie, you got to ride with somebody. No, nah, I ain't got to ride with nobody. Here's the problem. Once you turn down, once you reject an offer, now you're a target. And why is that? I want to explain this to you young guys. And I don't really care if the older guys say you can believe them if you want. I'm here to tell you the truth because this the truth is going to set you free. Here's the problem. 
if they allow you as a loner to reject their offer to join the gang, then there's no threat and there's no cohesion. Why? Because if I can turn down the offer, then nothing happens to me. Then why should you join the gang when they're going to be having you ask your old lady to bring drugs in? You got to hoop drugs. You got to start selling drugs for them. You got to start doing work for them. When I say work, they're going to say, hey, take that candy bar and put a hit on that dude who's a child molester or who killed my uncle on the street or who owes us money or who's got a gambling debt. You're nothing but a torpedo. So if they allow me to, to negate their offer, like, no, I'm not going to join it, they lose their power. They lose their illusion of power. Because when you're asked to join the gang in prison, the only, like Wes Watson says, the only answer you're going to give is yes or else. They'll roll you up from the yard, dude. You, not me, because I'm a savage. Like the first one or two guys, and I'm going to share with you the, the secret weapon and how semen retention is very powerful, and I believe in it wholeheartedly. What happens is when you practice semen retention, you get really, really, really angry, dude, and antsy. You get, you get aggravated because, dude, the male body is, 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 uh, is created to produce testosterone into your testicles so that you can release it into a woman that you find sexually attractive or, you know, a sexually viable mate to reproduce. That's the way we're, we're, we're wired and built uh, biologically, right? So when you deny your inner essence of humanity, which they say that's how you go to the next level of spirituality, you have to deny your carnal flesh, dude. And I did that for 10 years when you deny that. So just imagine if I did it for 90 days on the street and I was a champion, a local champion, a state champion, and went to the national level. I never made it to be a world champion. I guess it just wasn't in the cards for me or maybe I didn't have the genetics or maybe I didn't train hard enough. I thought I gave it everything, but obviously the proof is in the results. I never made it to be a world champion in anything. Yes, did I make it to the nationals? Yes, I've never been a national champ, but... The fact that I've been on the national level, I am a national level athlete. So what I'm saying is if I got to be a national level athlete from 90 days, periodic 90 days of semen retention, man, just imagine what, what happened dude, year after year after year. I didn't touch myself, defile myself. I turned down all kinds of homosexual offers. And just another thing, they send these transvestites at you, these transsexuals, these homosexuals at you to look like women just to see what you're made of. Everybody's watching you. In prison, everybody watches everybody because there's a pecking order. They're trying to see where you fall in. And I'm just here to tell you guys, man, the true story of my experience with semen retention. And this is what it, how, how I defeated the gangs because this is what happens, guys. So then I got into the thing with the San Quentin, right? Then my thing there, I get to New Folsom. They put me in a cell with a blood. And when I get to New Folsom, they're on lockdown because the Bloods and Crips are, go are going at it, man. So what happens, there's a representative that comes around and say, hey, is it squash? You know, can we have regular program? Because the whites got regular program and the, and the Mexicans got regular program. But the blacks didn't have regular program because the Crips and Bloods were at it, you know, against each other. So they're like, yeah, it's going to be cool. But that's just a lie because they want to get retaliation. So I'm in the cell. At maximum security prison to answer, uh, to answer a value subscriber's question. In California penal system, there is no single man cells unless you're in Pelican Bay. Even in the SHU, segregated housing unit that I've been in, no, there was there was there was no single man cells the prisons I've been in. And I've been in uh I've been in like I've been I've been to San Quentin, I've been to I've been to Mule Creek, I've been to Tracy. I got rejected from Soledad because <coughs> I had some correction officers that I was in the military with, they put me back on the bus. Then I was at Avenal, and then I was at Chino Prison. So I think that's five or six prisons. I've been to the shoe in each and every one of them. Why? Here's what happens. When you first get off the bus, dude, and they, they classify you, so then what happens, they put you in the cell. Man, your paperwork and word travels. This is the whole thing. They talking about, Wes Watson is talking about you got to hoop your paperwork. I'm not a gang member. I don't know nothing about that, but I just know that the clerks are all gang. I mean, the clerks are all inmates, and they they get paid off. Everything is about information and power. So the clerks tell everybody, you know, oh, if it's somebody from up north coming, they tell them, you know, they tell the up north dudes if it's somebody from down south coming, they tell you what what's going on with prison you're coming from. So when you travel, your reputation precedes you. So my reputation was when I was in uh, New Folsom. 
I broke off a blood dude, and the bloods told me that that was not authorized. And I told him, man, fuck you, man. That dude, because what happened was we in the cell, and he's he's, he's making a shank, man. He's making a shank on the, on the bottom floor. And I think what he did was he took a toothbrush and he just filed it down. Shh, 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 shh. And I just kept hearing that noise. And I was like, what you doing, my man? He's like, don't worry about it. And I knew what he was doing. I was just trying to be, you know, to get him to have a conversation. And I said, hey, man, is that a shank? And he said, you need to mind your own business. And I said, dude, that is my business because if the police come up in here, you get an extra year if they raid your cell. And let's say they raid your cell, me and you are in there, and they ask me, is this your shank? No, nah, you can't snitch on your celly because that's, that's bad news, bro. Never be a snitch. I don't care what nobody tells you. Just take it like a man. And then they ask your celly, is that your shank? Nope. Both of y'all getting an extra year. You're going to the shoe program. Why am I getting an extra year? I got 26 years for this fool. So I just told him like this. Hey, my man, if the police come up in there, you're going to own that shank, big homie. Because I, I can't snitch on it, but I'm telling you, you're going to own the shank, bro. And the fact he told me, hey, man, shut the fuck up like that. So then I just jumped down off the top bunk. While he was putting his head down and I stomped him, dude, into submission. And I did the three magic words. Man down, officer. So then I'm in the shoe program and the bloods was, you know, they got bloods in the shoe. And the northern guys and the bloods go to the yard together. In the shoe, you go to the yard too. But they separate the bloods and the crips and the whites and the and the blacks and the Mexicans. So the blood dude tells me, hey, hey, my man, what you did was not off the res. And I said, man, check this out, man. Don't nobody run my program, dude. I run my program. And they was like, okay, we see how it is, my man. You know what? We got something for you when we get back to the yard. Because in the shoe program, you can't get no weapons down there. That's one thing I know for sure. All that stuff you see in the movie Shot Collar, that's fictionalized in my opinion. So anyway, little did I know, my lawyer went back to court on the appeal, man. So he brought me back, dropped my points down from level four to level three. I went to court. When I came back, they put me back into the shoe program. And then from there, I got shipped down to Tracy. So then when I hit the yard in Tracy, like I said, your reputation and paperwork uh, precede you. And then the bloods was like, hey, man, you know what, man? You you, you put that hit on old boy. And that ain't, that ain't was popping. So I broke a blood dude off. So they take you from one yard. They put you on another. So then here's what happens. Then some of the crypt dudes from uh, Central California was on the yard and they remember when I blo broke off the blood dude and so now I broke off of two more blood dudes and so the Crips is thinking, oh, this dude's a Crip. But here's the difference and I want to be clear and I'm going to cut this video when I tell you this point because it's getting kind of long and I think you get the point. The Crip dudes thought I was Crip friendly and they asked me what set, what hood you from? I said, man, I don't ride like that. But see the word on the street or in the pen was, Oh, he broke off two blood dudes. So even if I'm not a crip, I'm crip friendly. So that allowed me to lift weights with the crip. That allowed me to eat with the crips, even though I'm not associated with them. What I'm saying is when you go to the chow hall, you got to sit with somebody. It's like you just can't sit by yourself. They march you in. They take you into the chow hall. When you get in the line to get your food, they tell you to sit down at the tables as close as when you look at the tables. If it's crips here, the blood's there. You can't sit with Mexicans or white boys. So you, you see the Crips that you've been lifting weights with. You sit with them and eat. And then now all of a sudden you're a Crip-friendly dude. But I'm not really a Crip. I'm just some dude trying to make it. But the more the story, I wanted to tell you guys this, man. It's, it's a lot more to this video. Maybe I'll make a part two. But I wanted to share with you conclusively. I hear all these scientific debates about this and that. And I want to talk to you guys about science before I leave. You know, I'm an old school weightlifter, man, from back in the 70s, dude. I, I trained with Arno and Lou Ferrigno and Tom Pless. Like, I'm from that era. And I'm going to give you an example. When they did weightlifting, they did old school weightlifting with momentum and cheating and bouncing, bringing it down to your chest, bouncing off your chest, cheating reps, all that kind of stuff. And now the scientists come out and say, oh, you know, if you cheat, or if you use weights and you bring it all the way down, it's bad for your shoulders. If you do shoulder presses behind your neck, it's bad for your shoulders. If you run and jump, it's bad for your knees, right? I'm not with the scientific method. And, and why do I bring that up, guys? Because basically what's going on now is they got the scientific method telling you what you can and, and cannot do. 
and how you live your life. And I'm just telling you, I'm old school. And one thing I know for sure, when I did semen retention for five years, and I'm going to leave you guys with this. When I was on the street, I readily admitted to using steroids. I competed in competitive bodybuilding and powerlifting. I've been doing bodybuilding, man, since I was like, uh, I don't want to lie to you, man, since I was like eight years old. I didn't start competing until I was like 17. That's how long it took me to develop my body naturally. So do the math, it took me like nine years. But by that time, my body developed, well, actually at 16, People thought I was in steroids because I've been lifting weights since I was eight with my older cousins, going to training camps, this kind of thing, taking protein supplements and amino acids and things like that. So I competed naturally from the time I was like 16 years old. And I want to I want to tell you the accurate, accurate story. I competed naturally until I was about 22 years old. So what happens at 22 years old? I was uh, 10th place at the Mr. Teenage Cali no, I was 10th place at the Mr. California in, uh, in San Francisco. And then I was asking the judges, how can I place higher? And they told me, you, you need more muscle mass and density. I had already packed on some mass, but what happens when you're competing in bodybuilding, when you diet down, you remove all of the fat. It just shows your lean muscle composition. I didn't have enough lean muscle. And back then I was competing at about 198. I dropped down to about 198 all muscle. In the off season, I walk around at about 240. So then they told me, you got to start, you know, taking juice. So, and I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. When I went down to Venice, California, and I met Arnold Schwarzenegger, my idol, and Lou Ferrigno, and, and Tom Platts, and Lee Haney, and Mike Christian. Shout out to you, Mike. They all told me, man, like, you got you got to juice up when you want to get to the next level. Because I went as, what I'm trying to say, guys, Working out from eight and competing at 16 and competing all the way till I'm 22, I had already maxed out my genetic potential because what's that? Eight and eight is 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Um, whatever, that, whatever the number is, I think I, I, I competed naturally, man, for a good amount of time. I maxed out my genetic potential and I started taking steroids and the growth hormone and all this stuff, dude, to take me to the next level where I'm setting records. So here's what I want to share with you, dude. And this is a true story. A lot of you guys come on here, you'd be killing me because you, 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 you don't understand back then there was no, there was no uh, internet, dude. There was no proper record keeping. But I know for sure I had a bench press of a 600-pound bench press. I had a 780-pound squat. And I had an 890 pound uh, deadlift, dude. I know that for sure. So then what I'm trying to say, when I went to prison, and I'll make another video about this. Yes, there are steroids in prison, but the, the amount that you get is so small, it's not enough to really take you to the Mr. Olympia level. There are small dosages in there, but you got to be a shot caller to get them. I was a nobody. But my 10 years in prison, I've been to six different prisons, and I was the overall weightlifting champion and all the different prisons I went to before they took the weights, and it was based on semen retention. What I wanted to share with you is I lifted the same amount of weights I did when I was on steroids that I did in prison, and it was from semen retention. I was so strong, guys. I could take 315 from the ground and press it overhead, dude, like one or two times, which is amazing if you know what 315 is. So I wanted to tell you that story because some value subscribers asked me to tell the story, and everybody's debating about semen retention i just wanted to tell you the honest truth that that is the one secret weapon that helped me to defeat the gangs in prison whether it was the bloods or the crips or the, when i say the mexicans i never had a problem with serenios for some reason they love me man i don't know why i never had a problem with serenios man they just straight up dudes norteños no trying to be disrespectful the ones that i've met the ones that i know they're two-faced man you know they act like they cool when the numbers are low, they act cool with the brothers so they can, because they're always outnumbered by Serenos. And no offense to any, you know, northern Mexicans. I love you guys, man, if you're not a gang member. If you're a gang member, I, I got no words for you because you're two-faced. Because when their numbers are low, you'll ride with the brothers and the others to, to pump up your numbers. But then when your numbers are high, man, you, you turn, you, you flip the script. So if you're stuck with me this far, you want to hear some real stories like this, thumbs up the video. It helps the algorithm leave a comment like, hey, great video, nice story. Thanks for your honesty, OG. Welcome back, OG. And most importantly, subscribe to the channel and do a thumbs up. I mean, do a, a, a notification all. 
because me and my girlfriend are going to start traveling and uh, we're just trying to pin down the dates and it's really hard to do because there's so many holidays here and, and transportation is an issue when you're a foreigner. So, you know, just uh, hit the notification bell and until next time, OG Simpac out.